أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, the topic for tonight will revolve around a theological argument. The topic for tonight, inshallah, will be a topic that is very detailed, that has been spoken about throughout history, even prior to Islam, one that occupies a large proportion of the Islamic library and is still till today discussed within schools of Islamic theology. And that is the concept of free will versus predestination. The concept of free will versus predestination is one that needs a lot of focus and needs a lot of time to comprehend. However, inshallah, with the limited time that we have for tonight, we can decipher some points in which will allow us to comprehend it in depth. Inshallah, the first and firm, foremost, the first point I'd like to look at is the two extremes. One side being predestination and the other side being free will. What are their meanings and what are their extents? And at the final account, I'd like to look at the school of Ahlul Bayt and what it has to say about such issues. And inshallah, to conclude, we'd like to look at an example to let us with our limited intellect, understand how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries to test us with the idea of predestination versus free will. So inshallah, to start off tonight, please help me in reciting aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Predestination, in its essence, means that we believe in the idea that everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has predetermined. Every move that we make, Allah has predetermined. Everything that we think of and go towards, Allah has already predetermined. That's one side of the scale. And on the flip side of the scale, we have free will altogether. In which the concept and the thought process is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the authority to do everything in our own accord. And the idea that Allah has created the earth, the cycles within it, and He has left it for us to do whatever that we wish in that particular earth that He has created, within those cycles that He has created for us. So we find these two particular extremes, and then we have one school of thought that is in between the two. Now one school of thought known as the Ash'arites, these are the people that believe in predestination. Then we have the Mu'tazilites believing in total free will. Now let's look at why is it that someone may like to think about predestination? What kind of governments does it help out? What kind of authorities does it aid? Now if we think about it in the idea of predestination, we said that the idea is that everything that happens, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already, or already predestined. Therefore, if we look at the government that's happened in accordance or in the same timeline as the Prophet of Islam, the same timeline as the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, we find such as the Umayyad Khalifas, such as the Abbasid Khalifas. What did we remember them saying time and time again? When people would start to question them, saying that is this chair that you sit on or is this throne that you sit on for the Ahlul Bayt or isn't it? Their reply is the same thing that we discussed tonight, the idea of predestination, because they say that do not talk to me that I have taken the Khilafah. Don't talk to me that I have taken this particular seat. It's not my fault that Allah has predestined for me to take it. Therefore, this accounts for their actions. If, 
in actual fact, we believe in an idea and a theolog theological idea of predestination. Therefore, we see that it served the purpose of the Khilafat. It served the purpose of the Umayyads, of the Abbasids. Whenever someone would come forth and tell them, you have taken a right which is not yours. Their reply is what? Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given that to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already determined this. Therefore, your problem is not with me. Your problem is with Allah. That's how they try to push it away. On the flip side, the second point that we want to raise in the idea of predestination. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he's already predestined everything, need prophets? As in if Allah has already predestined that you do right or you do wrong. Or if Allah has already predestined that you go towards hell or towards heaven. Do we actually need prophets? As in a prophet has come to mankind to guide them. Either they listen to him and go towards heaven. Either they listen to him and they are in salvation or they go against him and they go towards the hellfire. Therefore, if we believe in the idea of predestination, it does not need any more prophets and imams to carry on the message, to guide people. Because Allah, in accordance to them, has already predetermined where you will go. Therefore, the school of Ahlul Bayt does not agree with this first one. On the second level, let's look at the idea of free will. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as they say, in the idea of free will, has created the earth, has created the cycles, and allowed us to do whatever we want inside it. Now let's look at the contradictions here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doesn't he have a hell? Doesn't he have a heaven? Doesn't he allow us, or doesn't he account for our every action? Doesn't he give us guidelines, the Quran, how to live our life? Therefore, the second is also disproved. Therefore, we find... What does the school of Ahlul Bayt say about this? Because we know what the opposition says. We know what the schools of thought outside the Ahlul Bayt say. In which Abu Hanifa goes to the house of Imam Sadiq alayhi afdal salati wa salam. Imam Sadiq's inside, Musa al-Kazim comes out, five years of age. Five years of age. He comes to Abu Hanifa, he says, what is it that we can help you with? He says, is your father home? Is your father Ja'far al-Sadiq home? He says, my father is busy. However, is there anything you'd like to ask me that I can help you with? Five years of age. He says, I have a jurisprudential question. He says, go ahead. If I can answer it, I'll answer it. If I can't answer it, I'll take it towards my father. So Abu Hanifa is thinking to himself, if he doesn't, he's obviously not going to answer me at five years of age because me at my great... And me at my old age can't answer this particular question. This five-year-old won't be able to answer it. He'll take this question, he'll go towards his father, and his father will answer me when we meet. So he says, what's the question, Abu Hanifa? He says, he says to him, I have a question in regard to predestination. He says, what's the question? He says, predestination, I don't know. Is the sin, when committed, going to be on my shoulder only, is it a joint relation between me and Allah or is only Allah in charge of that particular sin which I commit? So in essence, he's saying that who is in charge of this particular sin? The five-year-old, Musa al replies, look how beautifully he replies. He says, well, obviously it cannot have any relation to, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Hanifa pauses, he says, why is it? He says, well, obviously on the first instance, we can't say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be punished for a sin that we commit. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a hell and then heaven. He says, on the second occasion, we can't be half us, half Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because it's unfair that we are punished and wal ayadu billah, Allah is not. Therefore, the only conclusion is what? The only conclusion is that Allah has nothing to do with our sin and we are solely in charge of the sins in which we commit. Abu Hanif is thinking to himself, five years of age, and he's just answered the question that I've been revol it's been revolving in my head for so long. He goes away. Going back into the topic, inshallah, predestination versus free will. Let's look at the Ahlul Bayt. What does Ahlul Bayt say, have to say about predestination versus free will? Imam Sadiq asks this question. Imam Sadiq replies beautifully. He says to the man that asks him the difference between predestination and free will. He says, lift your leg or one of your legs. So the man lifts one of his legs. He says, at the same time, I want you to lift the other leg. The man says, it's impossible, I'll fall over. He says, that's the balance. He says, Allah 
is in charge and does not give you any will over some aspects of your life, other aspects Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the freedom of choice. Examples, we are not given the choice of where we are born, when we are born, when we shall die, whom our parents are. We don't have a say in that, do we? If we go ask that to the people that believe in free will, go and tell them, did you have a choice in which you were raised, whom you were born to, when you shall die? They'll obviously ask and tell you that we have no say in this. Therefore, my mom, mom Sadiq response to this is saying that in essence, Allah has some aspects of your life covered. He gives you the free will in other parts. When Abu Hanifa has three particular ideologies within his jurisprudence. Number one, he says that Iblis will not be burnt in hellfire. Why? Because he's made of hellfire. So he says it will want to be hurt by hellfire. Number two, anything that exists must be seen. And you find that ideology is still within other schools of thought. So number one, Iblis will not burn in hellfire because he's made of hellfire. Number two, he says that everything that exists has to be seen. And number three, he says everything is predestined. That's his ideas, that's his theology, that's his conclusion. Therefore, we find a particular person, this story is attributed to many people, but famously it's attributed to Bahlul, in which he picks up clay, and a hard clay, and he throws it at Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa is angered because he's in pain, takes Bahlul towards the court. He takes him in front of the judge and he says, I want you to prosecute Bahlul. The judge is thinking to himself, well, he's, he's, he's actually, he's a mad man. Or so it seems that he's a madman. How can I prosecute a madman? He says, you have to prosecute him because I'm in pain. He's thrown a rock at me and he deserves punishment. Then they go to Bahlul. They said, why is it that you threw this rock? He says, I have no guilt in the matter. He says, but you threw this rock. He says, it wasn't me that threw it. He says, he says, Abu Hanifa has the idea that everything's predestined. Therefore, it wasn't me that threw the rock. Allah made me throw the rock. If it's in accordance with Abu Hanifa. He says, secondly, the rock shouldn't hurt Abu Hanifa. They said, why? He says, Abu Hanifa says that Iblis won't burn in hellfire because it's made of hellfire. I've taken rock or clay. I've thrown it at clay. We're made from clay, aren't we? He says, I've taken clay, thrown it at clay, and clay got hurt. That's what Abu Hanifa says. Technically, he shouldn't get hurt. And in the third instance, Abu Hanifa says what? He says that everything that exists has to be seen. He says, he says that he feels pain. Can he show me pain? Therefore, the judge is left speechless, and he lets Bahlul go. The idea he's trying to paint to us is that not everything is predestined. The Ahlul Bayt teach us this. And they teach us furthermore that our actions may change something that's predestined. I'll give you an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for us a particular date in which we die. Let's say, for example, Allah's written for this person by the name of Ahmad to die in 30 years. In the narrations of our Prophet, of, of our Imams, it says that Silatul Rahim is one of the actions that you may do or not do that may increase or decrease your lifespan. Allah has written that you die in a specific date. However, if you enjoin relations with your family, the Imams tell us that Allah may expand your life as much as 30 years. And on the reverse angle, if you break relations with your family, Allah may decrease your life by as much as 30 years. Therefore, something that is in free will may have a direct effect with something that's already predestined. That's the effect that the Imams try to teach us, that everything is in your hands. Therefore, what can we learn? Or what example can we give to ourselves to analyze or to make us think of it in a more simplified version? An easier way to go about thinking about predestination versus free will. Now the example I want to give to you is a very, very significant one and a very detailed one. And the more you think about it, the more it applies. The example I want to give you is the example of the tree. The example of the tree, if you want to think about it, number one, imagine the root of that tree is the foundation. 
the foundation doesn't begin to branch out after, until a particular time, until a particular height. Now imagine the life of the person in his younger years, building the foundation to his future, building his iman, building his strength in his religion, before he reaches Bulugh, in which he begins to be in a state where he begins to choose his path. When he begins to branch out, now this is the idea of predestination versus free will. Allah knows, it's not that Allah doesn't know. Allah knows where you are capable to go. Imagine that tree and every leaf on that tree is an end destination that you have. Every branch, every twig, every turn that you make in that tree may be the parameter in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted you, has given you that space in which you can travel. Your end destination cannot precede those leaves in the tree, but they're the end destination. Therefore, Allah is all-knowing. But you cannot go outside that shell, which is what's predestined for you. But you have the freedom of choice to choose which branch to take, which twig to go to, which leaf to end up at. Imam Ali السلام, has a beautiful narration in in reference to trees. It says, Allah does not send the wind to the trees to make the leaves dance. It's to test the root of that tree. Take it into this example. The foundation that you build yourself in before Bulugh, before you reach that level of puberty in which you will be, your actions will be entitled to either a reward or a sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in which we read in the Ghufayla, in Salatul Ghufayla, in the second rak'ah, there is not a leaf that falls from a tree except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the knowledge of. Take that example into perspective. Take that idea into perspective to make us learn and to make us analyze the concept of predestination in a more simplified manner. And inshallah, I end with a question for tonight. And that question is as follows, because we can act upon our particular rewards or sin progress. However, when we are gifted, do we know that it's because of our sins or because of our rewards, of our good actions that we are given paradise? Is it because of our a'mal that we are given paradise? Is it because, is it because that I've done good? Is it because that I've read the Qur'an, that I've prayed? that have given zakat, is this the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us paradise? Or is it because of His mercy? Let's think about it. Our reward, our actions, or Allah's mercy? Now the jurists have all come together unanimously and advised that it's not because of our actions. It's because of Allah's mercy that He allows us to go into His heaven. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if it was not for Allah, would we have the brain to think to do that particular act? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't give us the legs or the hands or the will to go and work and earn a living, would we be able to give that charity? Would we be able to help the people in need? Will we be able to enjoin relations if Allah hasn't given us the opportunity to? Therefore, every single act that we do, Allah has the grounds or has given us the pulpit to do that action. That's why a sin is so severe because Allah has gifted us with everything to do that particular good. However, we use that same tool that Allah has given us to do evil or to do bad. And that's why we have to learn in Ramadan, especially in Ramadan, when we are given this pulpit in which Allah says, I, I have my mercy that's abundant in this month. Your breathing is tasbih in this month. Your sleeping is worship. Allah gives us this. Let's take it onto ourselves to be the best that we can be. Let's take it upon ourselves to grasp these rewards. Let's not let Ramadan go past until we take it to its full extent, utilize it to its full extent, and keep that ongoing until next Ramadan. And I end on this, brothers and sisters. Insha'Allah, we had a slight image of what predestination versus free will is. And insha'Allah, 
we have that in the back of our minds and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that note that he allows us to utilize the mercy or his mercy and his bounties in this holy month of Ramadan bi barakatil suratil fatiha tasbiqaha salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad